Okay, today's lesson is about interference of waves, and in particular the interference of light. We'll no longer just be thinking of light in terms of light rays, but think about the actual waves composing light as it travels through space. And uh, interference is based on the principle of superposition. You'll recall that. It says that if you have waves from more than one source, then the total wave is just the sum, the algebraic sum of the waves, the wave functions, whether that's electric field or air pressure or displacement, the algebraic sum of the wave functions from the individual sources. And it turns out that this principle has a lot of really interesting effects. And the simplest one is the case where you have two sources of waves. Okay, let's talk, take a look at the basic idea of interference. Um, so suppose we, uh, suppose we have a, a source of waves broadcasting out into space. Uh, here I've drawn a bunch of wave fronts. These wave fronts might, um, might correspond to the locations of the wave maxima, the crests of the wave, the places of maximum electric field or, or a, a maximum pressure or maximum displacement, um, uh, at, a, at a certain moment in time, there's a snapshot of the wave, and the wave, of course, is, uh, is propagating out in all directions from the source. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a snapshot of one wave, but oh, uh, the, the waves from one source. But suppose we have more than one source. So from the first source, the, the, the upper source, the waves spread out like this. From the lower source, the waves spread out like this. And so the waves of the pair of sources will, will be the, the sum of these two wave functions, which we can represent like this. And you see this is a, a fairly complicated pattern. Now along some directions, we notice that the crests of the two waves coincide. And along these directions, the, the two waves will add up to a stronger wave, a wave of twice the amplitude of each wave individually. And, and, and along these directions, we have what's called constructive interference between the two waves. The two waves add up to a wave that is twice the amplitude of the original. And therefore, by the way, four times the intensity. But there are other directions in which the two waves do not add up. The crests do not arrive together, but the crests and the troughs of the wave arrive in exactly the opposite, um, uh, exactly the, uh, the, the wrong time. They're exactly out of sync. And so the waves along these directions add up to something much less, maybe even adding up to zero wave, because one wave is positive when the other wave is negative. And in these directions, we have the phenomenon destructive interference. So constructive interference and destructive interference are the, the basic extreme examples of wave interference. Here's kind of a cool animation produced by um, um, uh, some guys at Penn State uh, showing uh, just exactly what we're talking about, but showing it in a, in, a, um, in, a, in a moving way. You can see the two sources of waves producing waves that spread out in both directions. The total wave is the sum of these two waves, and you can see that along certain directions the waves cancel out. That's destructive interference. Along certain directions the waves have twice the amplitude of one of either wave individually. That's constructive interference. Now let's consider one of those places where there's constructive interference between the two waves. So, so that place uh, um, is, uh, is a place where um, Wave crests from the first source arrive at the same time as wave crests from the second source. It isn't necessarily the same wave crests, but some wave crest arrives with, along with some other wave crest. So there's a certain distance from the first source, we'll call that R1, and there's a certain distance from the second source, and that's R2. And those distances might be the same, that would work, we're assuming the, the sources um, act in unison there in phase. Um, uh, it might be that these two um, um, distances are the same, but it would also give us constructive interference if the two distances differed by just one wavelength or two wavelengths and so on. So the condition for constructive interference is that the difference of those two distances is some integer, positive or negative, times the wavelength of the wave. Similarly, if we think about a point where there's destructive interference between the waves, where the waves exactly cancel out, 
That's a point where the troughs of one wave arrive at exactly the same time as the crests of the other waves. The positive crest and the negative trough cancel out. You get no wave or very little wave. And, and that will occur if the difference between these two distances, R1 and R2, the distances from the two sources, if that difference is half of a wavelength, or one and a half wavelengths, or so on. It's m plus one half times lambda, where m is an integer. So these are the conditions, the basic conditions, for constructive and destructive interference between the waves from two sources of waves that, that act in phase. Now this lets us write the condition for, for uh, constructive and destructive interference in a nice way. Now, let's assume that, that the, uh, the two sources of waves are actually pretty close together compared to the distance to the constructive or destructive interference that we're, that we're considering. So we have two sources, and they're separated by a distance d. Now, since they're close together, the, the two lines to the, to the point that we're considering, um, the distances r1 and r2, basically go along parallel lines. They basically form the same angle theta with respect to the, uh, the, um, the horizontal distance, the distance that's, that's perpendicular to, this, to the separation of the two sources. So, um, uh, since these lines are essentially parallel, we can form a triangle, a right triangle, uh, as, as I've shown here. Um, and, uh, and that triangle has, um, it is a right triangle, and one of the legs, which I've marked S, is actually the, um, the difference between R1 and R2. And um, the angle in that triangle is the same as the angle theta, the angle from the, uh, from the horizontal in the diagram. And so the net result of all this is that, is that that difference S, which is equal to R1 minus R2, can also be written D times the sine of this angle, the deflection from the horizontal in the diagram. And this lets us write um, the, the uh, constructive and destructive interference condition in a neat way. So what we have is we have two sources that are pretty close together, and, uh, and light from these two sources, or waves from these two sources, reach a, a, a distance, um, some distance away, they're going out at an angle theta. Does that angle theta correspond to constructive or destructive interference? And our previous um, uh, analysis tells us that it's constructive interference where d sine theta is equal to m times the wavelength. And it's constructive interference. It's constructive interference. It's destructive interference if d times the sine of theta is m plus one half times the wavelength. And of course, in either case, that wavelength, uh, that, that that in either case, m represents an integer, and that wavelength is the wavelength of whatever wave we're talking about. Now we've been discussing this as the interference of waves between two sources of waves. But it also happens that this is the kind of interference you get if you have waves that pass through an opaque screen through two openings, or slits. So imagine we have an opaque screen. Uh, it, waves are absorbed at this screen, except that there are two openings, two holes, two perhaps very narrow slits whose centers are separated by a distance d. And on one side of the screen, we have, um, uh, we have uh, uh, a source of waves. So the waves impinge on the screen, they're absorbed everywhere except at the two openings. Now, remember Huygens' principle. Huygens' principle tells us that each point on the wave front of a wave can be regarded as a source of secondary wavelets, which combine to form the, the wave that goes later on. That means that each opening in the screen, each slit, can be regarded as a source of waves for the waves that, uh, that, that proceed beyond the slit. And so, because we have two sources, we wind up with an interference pattern, just as we saw before in two-source two interference. So this is, in fact, the way we usually, um, uh, we usually do this uh, experiment with light waves, and it's called two-slit interference. So what would this look like? Well, if we look at the light from, from two slits, we find that in some directions we have constructive interference, in some directions we have destructive interference. And if we projected this light onto a, onto a screen, we'd see that in some places we'd have brighter light, that's where the interference is constructive. In some places we'd have much dimmer light, 
That's destructive interference, the points of destructive interference. And this pattern of light and dark bands on the screen is called a pattern of interference fringes. And, uh, and we can tell where the constructive and, and destructive interference um, occurs by looking at the light and dark interference fringes. By the way, the phenomenon of interference is absolutely characteristic of a wave phenomenon. If we see interference, we know that something propagates through space as a wave. Suppose instead that we had light, we imagined light as a stream of particles of light, light corpuscles, Newton called them. And the corpuscles impinge from the, uh, from the, the original source onto a, an opaque screen with a couple of, of slits. Well, if we only consider the, the, the uh, particles that go through the first slit, then they hit some region of the, of the distant screen. And if we only consider the particles that go through the second slit, they hit some region of the distant screen. And if we look at the light that goes through both slits, we just get some combination, some simple combination, of those two smears of light. In other words, we don't get any interference. We don't get anything like the alternating bands of light and dark that we see because light is a wave phenomenon, the phenomenon of interference proves that light propagates as a wave. Now the wavelength of light is very small, and that has the effect that the angles involved in the interference phenomena are often very small. And when those angles are small, then um, there's, a, uh, there's a simplification that, uh, that is very useful. So suppose we have uh, two sources or two slits um, producing light, and we're looking at what directions we'll have um, constructive interference. And the angle theta in this diagram between, between the, the center line and the direction of constructive interference is very small. The screen on which we'll project the light is a large distance r away from the slits, and the lateral position of that intensity maximum we'll call y sub m. Now, um, because the angle is small, the sine of the angle is about equal to the tangent of the angle, which is about equal to the angle in radians, and that, that is the, the ratio of ym over r. And so the condition for constructive interference is that m times lambda, m being some integer, is equal to d sine theta, which is d y sub m over r. Or, solving for y sub m, we find that y sub m is equal to m times lambda r over d. These are the lateral positions of the bright fringes in an interference experiment. Lambda r over d is the spacing between adjacent fringes. And that's something we can measure. So let's suppose we do an experiment with visible light, green light, of a wavelength of about 500 nanometers, and there's a distance r between the, uh, between the slits and the screen. Uh, r is 2 meters, let's say. And d, the separation of the slits, is just half a millimeter. Small, but perfectly possible to, to make then that spacing between the fringes, lambda r over d, works out to about 2 millimeters. This is not hard to work out. You have to be careful about the powers of 10. 2 millimeters. So that means there will be a spot of light separated by dark, uh, spots of light separated by darkness every 2 millimeters um, laterally across the distant screen. That's the spacing of the interference fringes. And of course, if we don't know the wavelength of light, we can nevertheless figure out the wavelength of light if we know the spacing of those lateral fringes, the lateral spacing of those fringes. And that's exactly how Thomas Young, the, uh, the great English uh, Egyptologist and physicist and physician uh, about 200 years ago, um, figured out, first of all, that light was a wave, and secondly, he figured out the wavelength of visible light. Uh, he did this by performing an interference experiment. Uh, and indeed, he, um, uh, he explained it in pretty much the same way we've explained it. Here's what he said. Suppose a number of equal waves of water to move upon the surface of a stagnant lake with a certain constant velocity and to enter a narrow channel leading out of the lake. Suppose then another similar cause to have excited another equal series of waves which arrive at the same time with the first. Neither series of waves will destroy the other but their efforts will be combined. If they enter the channel in such a manner that the elevations of one series coincide with those of the other, they must together produce a series of greater joint elevations. 
but if the elevations of one series are so situated as to correspond to the depressions of the other, they must exactly fill up those depressions, and the surface of the water must remain smooth. At least, I can discover no alternative either from, ex from theory or from experiment. That's how Thomas Young explained the principle of superposition and the phenomenon of interference. So that's the quick and dirty introduction to interference. In class, we'll see that whenever light can take more than one path to get to a place, that leads to the possibility that you'll have interference effects. And those effects can be really interesting and, uh, and very significant. Uh, we'll, and we'll talk a great deal about, more about this um, for the rest of this week, and also next week when we'll talk about the close cousin of interference, diffraction. So that's all to come. See you in class.